very much looking forward to hearing what he has to say. Uh, Leonard von Lodenhoff, please welcome him. Hi. Uh, well, I, I do think it's, uh, it is easier to understand our unconscious than our consciousness. So the unconscious mind, meaning what you're not aware of, things that happen automatically, that you have little or no control over. Whereas uh, myself and perhaps you, trying to understand what makes your conscious thoughts go is a totally different question. So we'll call that the not so hard problem. Okay. I don't have any slides. I, I could dance for you, but I'll just talk and, um, and uh, I, I'll go without the visuals. Deepak, yes. my friend. There was so much in what you said that I would like to uh, comment on. Um, and I did in some, some in our book. Um, but for now, I'll just pick one thing. Scientists are not embarrassed by not having a theory of consciousness. Let me say that. It's very important to know that, that um, to say, I don't know, is OK. It's one of the basic tenets of science is to say, I don't know. And even when you have a theory, to try and poke holes in it. So I, I, I just wanted to, to say that, that we would be embarrassed if we were embarrassed by not having a theory, OK? <laughs> so we're not, we're not embarrassed by that. And I think that's really the issue is, um, that I'd like to talk about today, which is uh, knowledge and, and how we attain it. <clears throat> so uh, from my point of view uh, as a scientist, not, not, not a philosopher, um, uh, there, there's three ways of uh, uh, coming at knowledge. One is through your feelings or your intuition. Th that is a, perhaps the most human way. And if you go back in history, uh, you can find those kinds of theories all the way back as far as we have uh, recorded history. Uh, people used to explain eclipses because they thought that wolves were dancing across the sky. And when the wolf blocks the moon, that's a, that's a lunar eclipse. And if they hit pans, made noises, the, uh, the, the eclipse would go away because they scared the wolves off. And you know, every time they tried that, it worked. So you go out with these pants and you go bam, 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 the eclipse goes away and you start believing that you're chasing the wolves away and the eclipse goes away. So that shows you that um, it takes a little subtlety to understand when your theories are right and when they're wrong. But I don't mean to say that, um, that having theories based on your feelings or uh, your intuition is, is, is wrong. I do mean to say that's not the best way to approach the goal of predicting what's going to happen in the physical world. But I, you know, I don't deny that form of knowledge. And I have to say, Deepak has helped me to appreciate even more that form of knowledge. Not that I wasn't spiritual before I met Deepak. But anyone who meets Deepak gets even more spiritual by osmosis. So, um, but I, I feel, for instance, that if you're good to other people, it kind of comes back to you. And, um, my conscious mind tells me that's not true. And you can look in the news every day and see all kinds of people who are nasty, who are doing just fine. And yet, I, I tend to have this feeling that, that this happens, and so I behave that way. So that's one way of getting knowledge, and that, I think, is very appropriate for human interactions. In um, a few hundred uh, years BC, the Greeks pioneered a new way of getting knowledge, also the ancient Indians, uh, you know, which is, um, what I call philosophy, it's, a, it's my definition of philosophy, which is to understand the physical world uh, based on reason and logic. So for instance, I want to use one example. Uh, the atomists, the ancient atomists said to themselves, uh, they sat down one day, I suppose, in Greece, and it was a sunny day, and uh, they had their slaves doing their work for them so they didn't have to you know, work too hard, and they were thinking a lot. And they were saying, what happens if I take this stone and cut it in half? and I cut it in half again, I cut it in half again, and it's getting smaller and smaller, does that process ever end? And there's only two possible answers to that question, right? Yes and no. So some of them took the answer no. Aristotle, I think, was one of those. And, but um, about five or 600 BC, some people called the atomists took the answer yes. And they called those things atoms. And they came up with theories of those atoms. So they didn't just say it ends in something. They kept thinking. They said, well, why are there different kinds of, um, why is there different kinds of matter? What causes that? So they imagined that these atoms, some of them were spiral shaped and some of them were hexagonal shaped and they had different shapes. And putting these atoms of different shapes together makes different things. And they said, um, well, if, if, if these atoms are all there is and, and they bump into each other and they move around, uh, 
what's the result of that? Well, the result of that is that everything that happens in the universe is a result of these atoms bumping around. Then you should be able to, uh, to predict what's going to happen based on these atoms bumping around. So where's free will? And some Greeks were very upset by this. They thought that the idea that, that the world is made of atoms and, the, and, and everything happens because these atoms bump around takes away the idea that we can control what we think or what we do um, means that there's no free will. And they discussed this at length for hundreds of years. This is the, the philosophical approach in atomism. So let me contrast that now with the third way of thinking. So first we had feelings and intuition, then we had reason and logic and mathematics. And then we have the third way of thinking, which really um, came into, um, uh, well, ripened, let's say, in, in the uh, late 1500s, the 1600s, 17, even, even in the eight, 19th century, the early 1800s, uh, scientists are still developing what we call uh, the scientific method and what it means to do experiments and to test our theories. So uh, the scientific method uh, is based on the idea that, that you don't just use your reason and your logic and your mathematics to, to um, describe the world, but you, you use that to make predictions about what will happen in certain situations. And then when you make those predictions, you test whether they're true and then you go back and you re readjust your theory accordingly if it's not true. Um, and you do this, as, as Deepak said, in, in a loop of experimenting, observing, revi revising, until you have a theory that, that you believe, um, well, until you have a theory that's confirmed by all the experiments that you can do. But as I said earlier, with the wolves dancing across the sky, the, the main thing that a scientist tries to do is not to prove his or her theory, but to do what? to disprove the theory, okay? If, you know, if you sit in on, on, a, on, a, uh, science, on, a, on a seminar at Caltech or any other university where science is being discussed, um, people aren't going, I know, you can, if, you, if you do this, that should work. They're going, I bet if you do this, it won't work. And that's, that's what scientists have to do. And the hardest thing, of course, is to do that to your own theories. But that's what you have to do, because it's very easy to convince yourself that when the wolves are dancing across the sky and you go like that, and the, and the eclipse goes away, that you did it. So let me do, give you a little example uh, uh, you can do in your heads, okay? Here, I'll give you three numbers. Two, six, and 10, okay? I came up with those numbers based on a rule. And if I had a small group, I could ask you, I want you to all think about what the rule might be. And I could ask you, you can test the rule by giving me three numbers, and I'll according to whatever you think the rule is, and I will tell you, yes, it's the, it, it, those numbers work, or no, they don't, and then you can get, ex, you can get evidence for whether your theory of my numbers is right. So I might say, you might say, oh, Leonard, uh, how about, I said 2, 6, 10. You might say um, 10, 14, 18. I'll say, yeah. You'll say 20, 24, 28. I'll say, yeah. And you'll keep going, and you'll get excited, and you'll go, wow, the rule is every four numbers, even numbers with four in between. And I'll go, no, you were wrong, OK? And someone else might say, I know what it is. I know what it is. It's, how about these numbers? 6, 10, 30, yeah, 2, 100, 400, yeah. And then that person says, I know what the rule is. The rule is they're just even numbers, increasing even numbers. And I go, no, why, you know, why didn't you get the right answer? Because you're, you, you guessed these, that these were my rules and you tried to confirm them. But someone who has the other mindset might say something like this. The, well, yeah, that first rule sounds good, that second rule sounds good, but how could I disconfirm that? Leonard, how about 1, 7, 12? So he picks some odd numbers. And I will go, that does fit my rule. Well, now you know, oh, those other theories were wrong. And in actuality, my rule was simply three increasing numbers. That's all, that's simple. <laughs> so this is what scientists do all day. They come up with theories and they try and disprove them. Now, what happens you know, with atomism, the Greeks were not able to use atoms to make lasers or, um, or anything else useful that we have today, cell phones, computers. Uh, they had their philosophy and, and they had their beliefs about what happened, but it wasn't a scientific theory. So when you apply it to the physical world, it had no predictive value. And when the engineers of the day, like Archimedes came along, uh, they couldn't use those theories to, to build anything. In the 19th century, when a scientist uh, re resurrected this atomic idea, 
uh, using mathematics and the ideas uh, for, of Newton, Newton's laws, uh, they found that you could make a quant quantitative theory of atoms. They put mathematics in there and they said, what are some predictions? Well, one prediction, if you study chemistry, you'll know that there's this thing called the ideal gas law. You don't have to know anything about atoms. You just know that if you have um, a, a gas, most gases, uh, and you put them in a container, you have this expression, uh, pressure times the volume is proportional to the temperature, okay? So um, in other words, if you raise the temperature, you're raising the volume if you keep the pressure constant, right? Um, if you raise the pressure and keep the temperature constant, you're squashing it down to a smaller volume. That's kind of what that's called the ideal gas law. Well, a physicist in the 19th century said, well, what if we have this idea of atoms? We don't really know what atoms are. We can't see them. So these are the unseen, Deepak. Uh, physicists are dealing with the unseen and it's indirect knowledge, but they're saying, suppose that they're there bumping around like billiard balls following Newton's laws. We don't know what they're made of. We don't know much about them, but let's just suppose that's what's happening. What would this mean about what we call pressure, temperature, and volume? And they use this microscopic model of atoms that they hardly knew anything about, and they derived the ideal gas law. So this was a way that scientists said, oh, we believe more now in our theory that atoms really exist. And yet it wasn't really that convincing. And through the 19th century, physicists came up with many other um, uh, examples of how they can use these, this, this picture of, of things colliding to derive results that were um, already known. But um, what really convinced scientists that atoms exist was Einstein, actually, in something that, that probably most of you don't realize. Uh, it was, um, uh, 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 he, he uh, analyzed a process called Brownian motion. Nothing to do with relativity, nothing to do with quantum theory. But Einstein, in his younger days, was very um, interested in statistical physics. And he asked, the, he, he looked at, okay, Brownian motion is, is uh, the phenomenon where if you look in, um, like at a slide, a piece of uh, a pollen dust or something on, on, on um, floating in water and you magnify it, you'll see that it jiggles around and it, it moves what we call a drunkard's walk. I wrote a book with that title. It's a random walk. It just kind of bounces around. And no one could really explain that. At first, when it was discovered, people thought this is evidence of the life force uh, because they, they discovered it with organic um, specks of organic substances. And they thought these were like the molecules of life. But then they saw that inorganic things did that too. And for many decades, it was a big mystery. What makes these things um, jiggle around like that? And Einstein used this idea, this picture of atoms his idea, and some people had thought of this before, was that maybe it's the atoms bouncing around and hitting, hitting the pollen, making a jiggle. But just having an idea, again, in, in science and physics is not enough, okay? Because how do you test that? Well, Einstein put that into a numerical theory, okay, into a mathematical theory. And he, he predicted, based on this picture, how, um, how often the jiggling should happen, how far the jiggling should go, or if you basically make a graph of how often the jiggling goes a certain distance, you get a, a certain prediction. Sometimes it jiggles a little bit. More rarely than that, it jiggles a lot. Um, quite often, it jiggles very little. And, and, and he made a prediction show about how the, the characteristics of the jiggling, and, um, and it was true. And so this is what really um, ended this whole uh, discussion over thousands of years about whether there are atoms. So these are the three ways of looking at knowledge, right? There's the feeling and the intuition, there's the pure reason, and then there's the um, using observation. So um, the question that I guess that I want you to think about as we have our discussion later is, you know, which of these, uh, they're all valid in certain respects, and which of these do I want to use to understand uh, the universe, the creation of the universe, the evolution of, 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 of species, or other questions that we ask? And I say as a scientist that when it comes to the physical world, where the universe came from and what happens in the world, that, that the scientific method is the, is the method to use, which is why the Greeks you know, didn't have radios or microphones, and we do have that today. Um, and that you know, um, when you're looking at spiritual issues, uh, there's plenty of room for, for using other methods. And consciousness is a funny topic because Scientists want to understand consciousness based on the physical, the, what, what consciousness is from the physical point of view. And it also has a lot of meaning for us in our everyday lives, in our emotional life, in our spiritual life. And so I don't think there has to be a clash between the two ways of looking at the thing. But we have to understand that while scientists are looking at how the brain creates uh, experience and what it even means to have an experience, um, you know, others are looking at what it means as a human being to experience things. And, and so we just have to take 
all these ideas and all this knowledge from the different angles and, um, and integrate ourselves and, and, and in a way that, that we have the richest understanding of, of, of what's going on. Thank you.